Hi, I am Dr. Felice Gersh, your integrative OBGYN, and I'm speaking to you from Irvine, California. I have a practice, the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine, where I see patients, predominantly women, but some men, every Monday through Friday. But today, I am not seeing patients. I'm talking to you about a very important topic, the vaginal microbiome. Now, I have tried to talk about this topic twice, and I've had problems with my internet connection, but I feel the third try is the charm, and this one is going to work because this topic needs to be heard. So, why is the vagina and its microbial population important? Isn't it just an inert tube for having sex and for the baby coming out? Actually, it is much more than that. So the vagina, a unique structure for women, is really quite an incredible structure. During pregnancy, for example, in the last month, the last four weeks, it accumulates a huge quantity of lactobacillus. These bacteria are the dominant type of healthy microbes during every stage of a woman's life during the reproductive years, they are the dominant microbial occupant of the vagina. However, during pregnancy, they really grow to great numbers in the last month or so. And then when the baby is born, it smears the whole baby with these microbes, forming the foundational layer of the microbial population or the microbiome of the baby. But what about during reproductive life? What's important about the vaginal microbiome during all those years? Well, the vagina is like the guardian of all the internal reproductive organs. It's also the guardian of the bladder. So what do I mean by that? I mean the microbial population that resides within the vagina acts as a barrier. And it turns out that what we call commensals. Those are the good bacteria that we want. They ferment and make short chain fatty acids and other molecules that actually kill, they actually kill bad invading bacteria. So they really are guardians. They're like the, the military force of the vagina to keep out bad guys and to maintain a homeostatic environment. Now, the vagina is a very unique structure in that Part of it, the bottom portion that goes out to the world, has air accessible to it. And the bacteria that live in there are called aerobic bacteria. By that I mean they need and love oxygen in order to thrive. However, the upper portion of the vagina does not normally have access to air. And the microbes that live there are what are called anaerobes. They're bacteria that do not want any oxygen around at all for them to thrive. Now, in addition to these various strains of bacteria in the vagina, there are also naturally the virome, that's the viruses, and also the fungi that live, but they're not supposed to be overgrowing. It's all about balance. And unfortunately, in this day and age, many women have a dysbiotic or imbalanced vaginal microbiome. And this is a very big deal. Bacterial vaginosis and manilia vaginal yeast infections are highly prevalent. And they're more than just annoying, you know, creating a, a malodor or itching or burning or stinging. They are all of that. But they also increase a woman's risk of acquiring serious sexually transmitted infections, including HIV and HPV, human papillomavirus, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and of getting urological infections, urinary tract infections. We know also that when you have the wrong microbial population and you have overgrowth of anaerobes in particular, then what happens is you get infections during pregnancy. The bacteria can go up. I was taught erroneously, like so many things, in my medical school and training years, I was taught a lot of misinformation, but you know, 
everyone does the best that they can at the time, but I was taught that everything from the cervix above was sterile. Well, it turns out nothing in the body is sterile. What? There's no stop sign at the bottom of the, the cervix at where it meets the vagina that says no entry to bacteria or viruses or no, there's nothing there. So of course they can get up. And there is some protection with mucus and so on in the inside the cervix, but it doesn't prevent the bacteria from getting up. We now know that there's a unique microbiome of the inside of the uterus, the endometrial cavity of the fallopian tubes, and even of the ovaries. And the microbial population of these organs is definitely related to the microbial population in the vagina. And when you have the wrong microbes in the vagina, then you're going to have much greater risk of having the wrong microbes coming up and going out into these other reproductive organs. Now, we do not know because there hasn't been research on it, but there has been some data collected that women who develop ovarian cancer have a different microbial population of their ovaries than women who do not. Now, why do they have a different microbial population? Is it because they have cancer or did the different microbial population promote the cancer? And where did they get that abnormal microbial population? Did it come up and rise from inside the vagina? We don't know. We really should hopefully find out sometime. But what we do know is that having a healthy microbial population of vagina is certainly important for reproductive health to help prevent sexually transmitted infections from developing. And of course, for comfort um, in the daily life of every woman. Now, why is it that it's so prevalent that women have the wrong microbial population? Well, there's a whole variety of factors that may be contributing. One factor can be the fact that we now use intravaginal devices like tampons, menstrual cups, and then as women age, some of them use pessaries, and there's the old-fashioned diaphragm. Condoms can be used with spermicides. Different kinds of sexual lubricants can be used, and all of these things can have an effect on the microbiome. Now, for example, tampons. So tampons can be organic or not organic, and we'll go over that a little bit. But even when tampons are organic, they're sitting up at the top of the vagina. Remember, I told you a little bit ago that the top of the vagina is an anaerobic environment. Now you're introducing oxygen, it turns out. So you're changing the environment right there. Now, you've probably heard of toxic shock syndrome. Toxic shock syndrome is associated with tampon use. Fortunately, this is a very rare condition. I'm not gonna go into it in great depth, but just to mention a couple of things, it is associated with tampon use. It's also associated with menstrual cup use. In fact, the data shows no difference in the incidence of toxic shock syndrome with either, either use of either um, device. Now, why would that be? Because it turns out toxic shock, toxic shock syndrome is related to an overgrowth of the bacteria Staph aureus. Now, Staph aureus is a pathogen that shouldn't really be there, but it can be there because people use a lot of antimicrobial soaps. You know that antimicrobial soaps are now actually outlawed. You're not allowed to use in daily use in your home antimicrobial soaps, but they've been around for a long time and antiseptics are still around. And what they do is they kill off the staph epididymis, that type of staph that lives naturally on the skin and is the protectant type of bacteria. And then you can overgrow these pathogens that can get on the skin from visiting like hospitals and other areas that select for pathogens because they kill off a lot of other bacteria. So you can become colonized on your skin and then in the vagina with what are considered pathogens. Well, the staph should not overgrow. It should be kept in check even if it gets up in there. But when you put in tampons, it can cause more oxygen to get into the upper portion and cause because these are aerobic, it can cause an overgrowth of the staph in some women. Remember, this is a rare occurrence. And then it puts out toxins that can create this toxic shock syndrome. Does that mean you should never use a tampon? No, but it could suggest that maybe you shouldn't use them at night and not use them every single time, all the time when you have your period. Now, what about organic versus non-organic? 
Well, you always want to choose organic because the vagina is also a surface that you can absorb through. So if you use any kind of products in the vagina, and we do sometimes give medications and hormones through the vagina, you will absorb it, okay? So try to choose wisely and choose organic. When you do use a tampon, if you use menstrual cups, maybe don't use them at night, okay? Try to use during the day, and maybe you can use organic pads more than you previously have used them because that will allow the vaginal microbiome some time to recover. And I have to mention douching. So douching, which is very common, and in certain ethnic groups, they do it very routinely. And it's part of the culture. And it's considered like a cleansing routine to actually wash out the vagina. But you should not do that, okay? It's been shown that women who do a lot of douching increase bacterial vaginosis. They have overgrowth of the wrong bacteria, typically the anaerobes. So you don't want to be washing your vagina. You really do not want to do that. You want to leave it be as much as possible. And we don't want to put any chemicals up there. If you use a vaginal lubricant, try to use something, please, that's organic, that doesn't have added chemicals. And you know, if you don't need a lubricant, don't don't use a lubricant. And maybe just use the lubricant on the male rather than putting it up into you and trying to use just the amount that you really need. And um, and just be careful with it. And so we definitely want to be also cognizant of the clothing we wear. Try not to wear clothes that are not breathable, that can't um, that will allow moisture to evaporate. So you don't have a lot of moisture, which can promote overgrowth of yeast. We don't want to have overgrowth of vaginal yeast either. There's actually some concern that just as you can have leaky gut, that's where you have wrong bacteria producing toxic particles called endotoxins. And when you, they leak through the gut, because the gut barrier the cells become apart. We call them loose junctions, impaired gut barrier, and those toxins can actually pass into our own body and can stir up the immune system and create a low-grade chronic infection of bacteria coming in as well. Well, there's some thought that you could have a leaky vagina and have the wrong bacteria, the pathogens that can overgrow in the vagina, and they can actually cross into the body itself and actually increase the possibility of developing autoimmune disease. So every barrier in the body, every area that actually acts as a barrier between the inside of the body and the outside world has the potential to create an environment that can promote autoimmunity. So another good reason to do everything we can to have a healthy vagina. Now, what about hormones? Hormones are also really important for a healthy vaginal microbiome. We know that when women transition into menopause, their microbiome immediately changes in the vagina. Also, when women are on birth control pills or hormonal contraceptives, that they have an altered vaginal microbiome. For example, women on oral contraceptives have higher incidence of acquiring infections like sexually transmitted diseases. They have an increased risk of cervical cancer and chronic HPV and an increased risk of urological infections like bladder infections. So we need to be aware of that. And just think twice, do you want to be on oral contraceptives for your entire reproductive life? Or maybe you can get by with a different form of contraception um, and not use something that's going to interfere with um, these kind of issues. Now, there's no actual way out. You know, there's everything has its own risk factors. So for example, the copper IUD creates an inflammatory state within the uterus, which can also alter the vaginal microbiome and increase the risk for overgrowth of pathogens as well. So this is the problem. Nature just wanted women to keep reproducing and getting pregnant on a regular basis. And we don't want to do that. And so we do have challenges. I am the first to admit it. So sometimes it's good to maybe change up your contraception, maybe um, use condoms, maybe you can use them for a while and not use these other you know, types of methods that have impact on the vaginal microbiome. 
we don't even know what exactly the perfect vaginal microbiome is. As I mentioned, we know that lactobacillus is a really key component, but they've now broken down lactobacillus into different types. We know that one type, lactobacillus inners, is actually tends to increase right before the development of bacterial vaginosis. But we also know, or we did think, that lactobacillus crispatus was the main lactobacillus that was good, that was the foundation of a healthy vaginal microbiome. Well, now we know that this is breaking news pretty much, that there are different strains of lactobacillus crispatus and that different strains function differently in different women. So you could test for lactobacillus crispatus and find large amounts, but it's the wrong strain and it's actually creating um, an irritation and a dysbiosis in some women. So it's more complex than we even thought. And I can tell you, I thought it was very complex. So we don't know for sure what even is the perfect microbiome or what exactly is going to be the, the right crispatus type. We do know that you can test, and I do this all the time, PCR testing using a swab. We can test the vaginal microbiome, and we can see if there's at least for sure overgrowth of things we know are not appropriate. So I do recommend that all women who are having vaginal issues, unusual discharges, irritations, itching, that they go ahead and have the PCR swab and see what's going on in there. A culture alone is not adequate because you, uh, cultures don't grow everything. Things cannot survive once you take it out of the vagina, especially anaerobes, right? They're gonna die as soon as they hit the oxygen of air. So we need to do DNA testing with PCR testing. And these swabs should be readily available at your doctor's office. I know they're readily available in mine. Now, we're going to talk about treatment next time, okay? This was introducing you to what is the vaginal microbiome, why it matters, what can disrupt it, and I'll be back and we'll talk about how to try to fix it the best we can with the limited knowledge that we have. So take care. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.